It's not easy to be a Washingtonian for any length of time, right? Uh, and I, I've had three stories touch me in the last week um, that remind me of this. And they touch upon also, you know, the experiences that all of us share, I think, in one way or another, as residents of this beautiful place that we call DC, our home, right? And they touch upon also some of the dynamics at work in the scriptures tonight. In the first reading, we hear the prophet's uh, invitation, come, without pain, without sorrow, come, drink and eat to the full, bread, wine, honey, all this good stuff will be yours. It's a vision of what heaven is. It's a vision of what life can be and will be with God our Father forever in paradise. And boy, does it sound good right about now, right? Um, without pain, without sorrow, okay? But if that appeals to us, and if we find our mouths watering even now for that, it's because to varying degrees, we don't experience that on this earth, right? St. Paul references this, right? He was writing to very real people in very concrete circumstances. What will separate us from the love of Christ? Will anguish or nakedness? Will hunger? Will the sword? The reason that he's naming these things is because he knows that this has been the cost exacted from the Christian communities that he founded in various places for various reasons. Different persecutions, different arrests, executions being cast out of your family, being hungry because nobody in the town will look at you or talk to you anymore because you've become Christian. And St. Paul, along with our Lord in the Gospel tonight, the two of them give us a key that we can use to overcome all this, right? Jesus heard of the death of John the Baptist, his cousin, remember not just the last of the prophets, not just the one who pointed to him, but his blood, his cousin. When Jesus heard of the death of John the Baptist, he withdrew in a boat to a deserted place by himself. Whenever we hear in the gospel, and Jesus withdrew to a deserted place by himself, he is going to commune with God his Father. And the reason we know this is because at other points in the gospel, when he does this, he takes Peter, James, and John, and they relay the substance of what happened when Jesus communes with his Father in those deserted places. Because the Lord said, doing my Father's will is the food that sustains me. Right? Even the interactions that we have with each other are only bridges, only vessels, channels through which the Father's love comes to us and we are able to do his will with each other, for each other, through each other, right? Even marriage. Some of you are single, some of you are married. What is it? It's until death do us part. Why? Because in heaven there is no marriage. Marriage is a bridge. Marriage is a boat. Like all of the other sacraments that carries us through this life, it's a channel for the graces of God to work themselves out until finally we are united with him forever in heaven. Right? So even something as powerful as marriage is only temporary, right? Getting us to something even greater that we want for each other, that we want for the people we're married with. So Jesus goes to the deserted place. He communes with God the Father. Okay. Second, he feeds the crowds when they show up. He's in mourning for his family member. He's praying. He's, he's communing with his Father. And all these people show up looking for bread. And he would have been perfectly within his rights to say, you know what, gang, this once, no. <laughs> this, this once, please, leave me alone. I need a minute. I need some time to be alone. My cousin down in Jerusalem just died, got killed by the king for no good reason. In fact, the king's daughter asked for his head on a platter. So as if his death wasn't bad enough, right? This thing is worthy of a reality TV show. But he doesn't do that. He doesn't go into himself. He rather 
turns out and gives all the more. And he turns this into a moment to serve the Father. He turns it into one of the greatest miracles and a miracle very specifically connected with the Eucharist that he desires to give us at the end of his life. That's why the lines here, he said the blessing, broke the loaves, and gave them to the disciples, are the exact same lines that come during the Last Supper. And they are the exact same lines that we use in the words of institution here at Mass, right? Because the Gospel authors wanted us very specifically to connect this moment with the Eucharist. Why? Because as St. Paul would say in the second reading tonight, in all these things we conquer overwhelmingly in Christ. In all these things, all these sufferings, the sword, the nakedness, the hunger, the anguish, everything else, in all of these things we conquer overwhelmingly in Christ. How do we conquer overwhelmingly by being killed, by being hungry, by being naked, by being persecuted? The Eucharist. We say to the Father in heaven, you know what, everything that you've given me is a gift. Everything is a plus. I know I don't deserve it. I know that my natural state is to die. So I'm thankful to you, Father, for everything that you've given. And if every now and then the natural world reaches back up and smacks me, hunger, nakedness, the sword, anguish, etc., then, Father, I accept it and I offer it up to you as my sacrifice in union with Jesus on the cross. That is the Eucharist. Pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours might be acceptable to God the Father Almighty. Right? We'll hear those words in just a little while. So the Eucharist is the other part. Withdrawing to our private prayer place and being with our Father and knowing that He loves us even when everything else has been taken away is step one. And step two is then going out and giving to others even when we think we have nothing left to give. And what does the Lord do? What does the Father do with Jesus' gift of the Eucharist? He turns His crucifixion into resurrected life three days later. And he'll do that for you, and he'll do it for me every single time. The three stories of Washingtonian life, from my, maybe you can relate to this, I don't know. First one is um, there's a homeless man, and he's, he's a regular in the neighborhood. And I've had very pleasant interactions with him, and I've also had very frustrating interactions with him. And he shows up at, at church sometimes, which is not a problem except when he tries to sleep through the periods between the Masses, and I say, I'm sorry, we have to lock up the church, you have to step outside. We don't, we don't do that. And, uh, and today, it, you know, it's like with everything going on in life and in the city and everything else, and it was just like, you know, I'm, the water is like up to here, you know, on your priest. <laughs> we don't want it to go further. And first, he was sleeping in the church, and I said, I'm sorry, sir, you really, I have to ask you to leave. And so he stepped out, and then I find him outside sleeping, in the garden back where the ladies of the women's shelter take their time. And those ladies need great privacy and great respect because they've gone through a lot in their lives. So we try to keep that space off limits to non-parish people for their good, for their comfort, because they've been through a lot. They don't like strange men that they don't know coming on back there. So I had to go back and I had to say, sir, I'm sorry, you cannot be here. And then I walked my dog and I came back and I found out the rectory door was unlocked because on Sunday, a lot of people come in and out of the house for various legitimate reasons. And Father Rigdon said to me, he said, oh, that homeless guy came in the house today. I was just like, really, Lord? Really, you know? It's big city life. What are you going to do? It's not this man's fault. He's not well. Uh, you know, I'm not angry at him, but I'm, I'm kind of like, really, Lord? Life is going to reach up and smack me around like this today on Sunday on your day yeah so big city life story number one story number two something that I think we can all also relate to people leaving us Washington is a transient town right and people are constantly coming and going I've been hearing stories about 
the local apartment buildings, and of course the law students will not be returning, and we hear stories about, oh, well, a lot of people you know, are moving out, and so the, the rents have dropped, and this, that, and the other, and, and maybe your friends on your hall, or maybe your friends from neighboring buildings, or the people you used to go to happy hour with, maybe you're hearing stories of uh, an increasing rate of change, right, as people move or go out to the suburbs or whatever. Normally we hear about this in terms of, oh, we got married, the first kid's on the way, we need a house. You know, so as soon as people get married, I, I start the egg timer. I'm like, all right, give it, give it 18 months before I transfer them up to a parish in Silver Spring or Fairfax or wherever. Um, but it's hard because this time around, it's very, very dear friends of mine who I worked with to bring one of them into the church. I was present at their wedding when I was on Capitol Hill. I was present for the baptism of their children. I have pizza with them all the time. Uh, and so on, and they said to me, yeah, we're moving down to Charleston. We need something a little bit easier than Washingtonian life, and, and so on, and it's just a lot right now, and, and my heart was like, crack, <laughs> because they've been such a sure support and such beautiful friends. Again, maybe you know this experience. Give me a head nod. Do you know people who move and leave and so on? None of you have any friends? What? Yeah, okay, thank you. Yes, all right. Um, and the third story, and one that is particular to public life and, and priestly life, but again, the kind of thing that you may encounter in your workplace, right, or your, depending on who you work for here in the city. Uh, earlier today, the Washington Post published online a hatchet piece about my brother priest, Monsignor Pope, the pastor of Holy Comforter St. Cyprian Church. Now, in my life of ministry, which stretches back to being a campus minister in, in college, I've held the poor, I've worked with the missionaries of charity on two different continents, I've served in the poorest of the poor neighborhoods here, I've spent weeks on end walking in the slums of our city, our beautiful city, um, to, to meet people, to meet them where they're at, to engage with them, to bury their dead, when nobody else would, to provide them with whatever comfort and solace I could, even though I was utterly powerless to change many of their situations. I've been blessed to help people pay gas bills and stay in their homes and that kind of thing. If you doubled and tripled the good that I have done for the poor in this city, and if you halved the good that Monsignor Pope has done for the poor and the marginalized of this city, I would still be only a fraction of the good man that he is. And he contracted the coronavirus, and uh, this happened literally in the last 48 hours. He, he contracted it, was tested, went into quarantine, and his parish was inv invited to do the same. And he's followed all the rules and all the regulations and so on and so forth, but because of people on Twitter, and because of just, I don't even know what, what these writers at the Post were thinking, they've tried to take a hatchet to this man's reputation. And as a priest, who could, it could be me next, I mean, who knows, right? But as a person, too, a person who knows the goodness that this man has done, it breaks my heart, because it's not bad enough that he's sick. It's not bad enough that his parish has been so uh, disturbed by, by all of this. Their pattern of life and so on has now been thrown up in the air again. And that nobody knows how he got it. Nobody can know how he got it. He followed all the different regulations and so on and so forth. Um, but be, I think because he is a priest and a public figure, this author at the Post decided to go after him, and it just... It's like a knife right here in my heart because he does so much good. Now, he's not a saint. <laughs> I can say this about my brother priest. We know each other, we've worked together for years, and I disagree with him sometimes on you know, particular words that he chooses or this, that, or the other. It's like, Charlie, let it go, come on. Yeah. But if you multiplied all of my good and fractionalized his, I'd still be a tiny portion of the good that he has done for the neediest of the needy and the marginalized in our city. And today, it feels like somebody went after him. So 
so I would ask you to pray for him. But as I have these three stories, one with an individual, one with these two dear friends of mine, one with a brother priest who has been touched by public life, shall we say, and I'm sort of in medias res about all of this, it's like, Lord, what are you? What am I going to do? And I'll tell you next week if this works, but I think it will. I'm going to double down on my prayer time. I'm going to double down on time spent in silence with the Lord before the Blessed Sacrament or praying the Rosary with Our Lady. And I'm going to purposely seek out more ways this week that I can turn myself out and serve my people and be there for people because that's the Eucharistic sacrifice. That's what Jesus and St. Paul tell us to do tonight. And that's how, no matter what happens, hunger, anguish, nakedness, the sword, whatever, no matter what happens, that's how we bring 10 times more resurrection life out of each one of these very normal Washingtonian things that can happen to any of us. And that's how we find hope, the perseverance to go on and build a better community here on earth for tomorrow and secure heaven for eternity. Amen.